with our radio show. Let's talk about the sword swallowing. Okay. Are you really swallowing swords? <laughs> I mean, how difficult is it to learn something like that? Oh, come on. You, everybody knows the sword swallowing is just a trick, right? Yeah, it's just a trick. It's a, it's a rubber sword. It just rolls up yeah. before it goes down, right? That's, that's what everybody thinks. It rolls up, curls up into the handle, or folds up and telescopes in. No, honestly, that's what I thought when I was a kid. I grew up in Michigan City, Indiana, and my dad took me to uh, circuses up there in the 60s. And I saw these sideshow acts doing fire eating and card tricks and stuff, and I thought, eh, I don't know if that's real. And then they, the guy would swallow a sword, and I thought, there is no way he really saw that sword risked his life for 25 cents that we paid to get in here. I, I couldn't believe it was real. And in 1978, I was a missionary in India, in South India, and I saw swords falling firsthand where it started in India. And uh, it was close up on the street. I mean, you could tell there was no trickery or anything. It was, it was the real deal. And it kind of, kind of made an impact on me. And... Um, a few years later, 1997, I decided to get into sword swallowing as one of my thrones, as one of the things I really wanted to do in my life. And I started researching it, and I ran into a sword swallower, George the Giant, in Nashville, Tennessee. And I said, oh, man, I've been trying to learn sword swallowing. Give me some tips. He said, I'll give you two tips. Number one, it's extremely dangerous. People have died doing this. We know of 29 people that have died doing it in the past 150 years. Mm. Um, that's why there's less than a dozen sword swallowers in the entire world. Tip number two, don't try it. <laughs> don't try and, it. And I'm thinking, oh man, that didn't, that didn't dissuade me at all. It persuaded me that if there's only less than a dozen in 1997, I've got to learn it. So I decided I was going to contact each one of those 12 sword swallowers. And I did. I asked them all for tips. Nobody would give me any tips. But I started researching it. There are no books or, or videos or anything out on how to do it at the time. And so I studied every book, magazine, newspaper article, every medical research uh, x-ray I could find, and, and looked in all the medical journals, and I networked all the sword swallowers together into the Sword Swallowers Association, mm -hmm. and I began practicing, and I practiced 10 to 12 times a day, every day, for four years, a total of about 13,000 unsuccessful attempts before I got my first sword down on February 12, 2001. Well, now let's talk about unsuccessful attempts. What, what was going on? What would be a well, what would be a fail? Well, a fail is the, you stick the sword in the back of your throat and you hit your gag reflex in the back of the throat mm. and you can't figure out where it goes down and you just gag a lot, you know. And uh, it took practicing like that ten to twelve times a day uh, just to kind of get over the gag reflex in the back of the throat first. Then when I finally and you have to navigate a ninety degree turn uh, to get it down the esophagus, you have mm. to you know get everything lined up just right. You pass the gag reflex, then you have to flip open the epiglottis, relax, uh, slide the blade through the cricopharyngeal upper esophageal sphincter, through the hiatal ring behind the prominential laryngeum, the Adam's apple, down into the uh, pharynx in the upper esophagus. And when you do that, then you have to repress the peristalsis reflex, which is the 22 pairs of muscles that swallows your food. Then when you get down into the chest cavity between the lungs, the esophagus kind of makes a three-way juncture around the highest concentration of blood vessels in the human body, an organ known as the cardiac muscle, or the heart. And so I actually have to nudge my heart slightly to the left, and as the, as the sword goes down the esophagus, it kind of straightens out the esophagus and nudges the heart to the, to the left and to the side. And you can watch the sword beat with my heart like this, because it's leaning right on the, the heart, separated by about an eighth of an inch of esophageal tissue. Well, you were you then, were talking you were talking about the gag reflex as I was watching you swallow swords. Somehow that was activating mine. Yeah, it it does for most of my audiences. It, um, I mean, it, I'm it, not it, kidding it, you. I really, literally had to stop the video for a minute and just kind of compose myself, yep. and then start it again to watch it again because I knew what was coming. Yep. But when you stop and you do the countdown with you know yep. obviously large crowds watch you do this, and they're yep possibly like I am just like oh my goodness well at first a lot of people think it's fake you know and that's the fun of doing it you know I started out with juggling and balloon animals and still walking all these other things and you know people give you a polite pat, um, you know applause for that but the sword swallowing really makes an effect on people because people feel it inside themselves 
you know, while they're while you're swallowing the sword, and they don't believe it's real. Well, let me ask but, you: could could you walk into a museum and grab a sword and just swallow it, or or does this take special preparations to do this? Uh, yes and no. It mostly takes mind over matter preparation in my in my head in order. To um, I have to be able to, you know, know that I can do it. Now, I have, I walked into, I've got to tell you one little story. I was at a sword shop in Hartsville, Alabama, mm-hmm. several years ago, and I walked into this place, and they had all these huge honking swords, you know, inch and a half, two inch wide blades, and big claymores, and big monster swords, and dragons, and skulls, and stuff all over them. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, none of those are, are interest me at all. Then I saw a perfect little sword. It was about 20 inches long blade, and the blade was only about three-quarters of an inch wide. It was just a nice little blade and everything. And these two old guys were sitting there playing gospel guitar. They were sitting there strumming their guitars, and I said, do you mind if I look at the swords? And they said, yeah, go on, go on. <laughs> so I grabbed that sword, looked at it, and it was perfect. It was the right length, the right width, and everything. And so as I was looking at it, my mouth started to water. And so... <laughs> I, it had fingerprints all over it. I licked, I licked it off to lubricate it, and we'll kind of wipe off the fingerprint. And it was, it was super sharp. It had a sharp tip on it. And I just, I thought, I got to try this sword. It looks perfect. So I slid it down the, the, my throat and got to the back of my throat and very, very carefully navigated it down my throat. Mm-hmm. That's my, my heart aside. Went through the, the uh, past the breastbone, through the lower esophageal sphincter, down into the stomach, and swallowed that sword. And as I got it down, I kind of bent over a little bit and looked over, and those two guys had stopped playing guitar, and their jaws were open, their eyes were open <laughs> wide. They're looking at me, and I, I pulled it out like this and looked at it and, and licked it off, and I said, it's perfect, I'll take it. And, and they the were one probably guy, like, you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> no, the, the one guy said, he said, you can have it, you done ate it. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep it. It gives so a new that, meaning to you touch it, you buy it. Yeah. That's right. Well, so I got that sword the next day. I swallowed that sword on America's Got Talent uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, for the the regionals for America's Got Talent, and it got stuck in my throat. But uh, it, if you watch the video, it drops on down, and that one sent me on to the to semifinals in Vegas, and and that's been one of my favorite swords ever since then. Well, you know, watching you swallow these swords, it's amazing how far the sword is going down because. The sword stays a certain length, but you eventually run out of body, right? That's true. The swords can only go as far as the bottom of my stomach, uh, which is about to your belly button or your belt buckle or so. Um, if it went further than that, it would go all the way down to my fallopian tubes. And, and, and you always seem to Just lean kidding. forward with the sword in your mouth. I mean, is how dangerous is that actually leaning forward with that inside of you like that? Now, that is kind of dangerous. Um, there have been a couple times when I've punctured things. Um, last February, I leaned forward with about a 20-inch sword in me, and I pulled a 3,900-pound car out of Ripley's, believe it or not, in Baltimore, Maryland. Now, that is that the one that had the most jewels on it? Yeah, it had like a million Swarovski jewels on it or something. And it mm. was, uh, that sucker, it, I, I'm leaning forward. And it was pushing on my stomach, it was oh, pushing boy. on my teeth, my, my mouth was bleeding, and my teeth, my lips went numb and everything, but I kept leaning forward, leaning forward. And here's the trick, when you're swallowing a sword, when you have your epiglottis flipped open and the sword going down your esophagus, you can't really close your epiglottis to keep the, the, the saliva from running into your lungs, okay? Your epiglottis kind of is like a little flap that closes and keeps the saliva out of your lung, mm-hmm. lung. and so... When you got that sword in your mouth, it kind of generates the saliva, and you can't keep it in there for a real long time. Your your stomach's trying to reject it. Your whole body's trying to reject it. But I I leaned and leaned and leaned and finally got that car rolling. They didn't bother to tell me that that car hadn't moved in, in 10 months. It had flat tires on it. And I managed to get it pulled out of that showroom and pulled it about 12 feet out into the uh, Baltimore Inner Harbor area. And uh, it was it was that was a big major thrill for me. That was the same place that Nick Willenda had tightrope walked out into the Baltimore Inner Harbor just a few months before that. So it was a big big deal for me. Well, you know the sword swallowing stuff. We that it's just unbelievable. It's unbelievable the amount of things that you've done regarding that. But I, I want to touch base a little bit on some of the other things you've done. If uh, I really don't know how to say this, if they were going to make a movie about somebody yours would have like six or seven sequels 
I mean, <laughs> seriously, I, I just did a little research on you like we do with our guests. And, and just the more I looked, I was like, are you kidding me? This guy's done all. It's just thing after thing. One of the things that t- you know hit me in the head was living on an island for seven years. Yeah. In a loincloth, kind of a Tarzan thing going on. Yep, yep. What Can we talk about that a little bit? What prompted that? I mean, was that a decision sure. or an accident? Well, it was kind of a decision. Actually, I'm going to back up just a little bit. Okay. Um, in order Before I tell you about that island, there's a little backstory that you kind of have to understand. And um, I kind of talk about this in my TED Talks when I, when I give those and kind of tell the whole backstory. It kind of surprises people. But as a little kid growing up, I suffered from low self-esteem, inferiority complex, hmm. uh, fear of fail, failure and rejection. I was I suffered from something called social anxiety disorder, which meant I couldn't talk much. I would stutter. I would shake like a leaf and just start crying. And, and the bullies would tease me and beat me up and wouldn't let me play in any of their, you know, baseball or football or basketball or anything like that. So when I was a little kid, it, it just really bothered me. And I vowed. Uh, because I had so many fears, I, I had fear of everything. I was, I was afraid of the water. I was afraid of sharks. I was afraid of uh, heights. I was afraid of doctors and nurses and dentists and needles and drills and sharp objects. But more than anything, I was afraid of people, speaking in front of people. And so as a little kid, I um, kind of made a vow, and I said, you know, if the, the other bullies won't let me play in their sports games, if they won't let me play basketball, football, baseball, then I want to do real magic. So I would go home and I would read Guinness Book of World Records and Ripley's Believe It or Not books, and I saw real people doing the real feats. And I thought if the kids wouldn't let me play sports games, I wanted to do real magic things that the other kids couldn't do. I wanted to find my purpose and calling. I wanted to know my life had meaning. I wanted to do something really remarkable with my life and somehow change the world and prove that the impossible was not impossible. And so uh, fast forward 10 years, I uh, went to a college out in Iowa, and then I went uh, with a, a Lutheran youth and kind of group as a missionary to India for a better part of a year mm-hmm. in 78. And while I was over there, I mean, I was scared of everything. But while I was over there, uh, it was the week before my 21st birthday, and my buddy Greg Ormson asked me a question. He said, do you have thromes, Daniel? And I said, thromes? What are thromes? T-H-R-O-M-E-S. And he said... Thromes are major life goals, like a cross between thriving for goals and dreams. Like if you could go any place you wanted to go, be anything you wanted to be, do anything you wanted to do, where would you go, who would you be, what would you do? And I said, oh, man, I can't do that. I'm too scared. i got too many fears. And that night, it was about 105 degrees. We were living in uh, Tiruvannamalai, uh, Tamil Nadu, India. And it was about 105 degrees, so I took my little rice mat up on the roof of the bungalow, stretched out under the bungalow, and I was watching the bats dive bomb from mosquitoes up there. And I, all I could think about when I went to sleep was thrones and goals and fears and what I wanted to do, you know, when, once I had my 21st birthday, which was just a few, a few days away. And I fell asleep thinking about thrones. A few hours later, I woke up, and my heart was racing, my knees were shaking, um, and I was... Uh, my body was convulsing. My brain was burning up with 105 degree malaria fever. Oh, man. For the next five days, I was on my deathbed fighting for my life with malaria fever. And um, finally, the night before my 21st birthday, in a moment of clarity, when I kind of came to and my fever broke, I realized two things. I realized that that little tiny mosquito that had bitten me, called Anopheles stevensi. That little mosquito weighed less than five micrograms, less than a grain of salt. And if that little mosquito could take take out a 170-pound man, I realized that little mosquito was my kryptonite. That was my, you know, my undoing. Then I realized it wasn't even the mosquito. It was smaller than that. It was the parasite inside the mosquito called Plasmodium falciparum that infects over 120 million people every year and kills over a million people a year with malaria. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, no, 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 it's even smaller than that. It was fear that had crippled and paralyzed me my entire life. Fear that was my kryptonite, my parasite, my entire life. And so that night, I prayed a little prayer, and I said, God, if you'll let me live till my 21st birthday, I will not let fear rule my life any longer. I'm going to put my fears to death. 
I'm going to take on risks and challenges. I'm going to find my purpose and calling. I'm going to, I want to know my life has meaning. I want to do something remarkable with my life. I want to prove that impossible is not impossible. So I won't tell you guys if I survive until my 21st birthday or not. I'll let you figure that out for yourself. <laughs> well, I was just thinking about how you've really held up your end of the bargain. <laughs> well, God held up his end, and I did survive until my 21st birthday. But I mean, you've even night, survived shark attacks, correct? Well, that yeah, well, that night, that night, I made my list of my first ten thrones, and it was that I wanted to visit all the major continents of the world, visit the seven wonders of the world, learn a bunch of languages, live on an island, live on a ship, live with a tribe of Indians in the Amazon, uh, climb to the highest mountain in Scandinavia, uh, see Mount Everest, climb to see the Mount Everest at sunrise, work with the circus, work in the music business in Nashville, and jump out of an airplane. And when I came back from India, here's where I pick up the story which you were you were asking about. When I came back from India, I had the opportunity to move to the Bahamas and live on a little island down there. It was called Barry, um, Little Stirrup Key in the Barry Islands. It was about um, two or three miles long and about a third of a mile wide. And I was the only one who lived on the island from 1978, 79, till about 85. And then a cruise ship started stopping from 85 to 87. So I was a scuba instructor on the cruise ship. And I had plenty of time to talk to God and to get used to sw- you know, swim with sharks and, and get used to water and get over my fear of water and sharks and everything else. And uh, God had just taken me from there to Ecuador and to live with a tribe of Indians down there and then work in the music business in Nashville and work in Sweden and uh, the music business there in London. And then I climbed to the top of Mount Kebnekaisa and uh, high above the Arctic Circle in Sweden. And last year I got to see Mount Everest in Nepal in the Himalayas at sunrise. And how beautiful was, awesome. was that? How beautiful it was, was awesome. that? It was awesome. So anyhow, I, I deviated a little bit, but that's, and the sword swallowing is really just one of my many thromes. If you go to thromes.com, you can see probably a thousand thromes that I've set up, all these different countries I've wanted to visit. And um, I've found my purpose and calling now. And it's not what everybody thinks. It's not in swallowing the swords, my strength. It's actually using my weakness, my words, and inspiring people to be superheroes and do the impossible in their lives and to find their purpose and calling. My purpose and calling is to help others find theirs. And so I go around the world and inspire people that you can do the impossible. If a scared, shy, skinny, wimpy kid from Indiana can do the impossible, so can you. You know, you hold 35 world records. That's what it says right here in front of me, right? 35. Yep. And you said you've jumped out of an airplane. Have you ever swallowed a sword while jumping out of an airplane? Uh-huh. No, but that's on my list. Is it? You know, <laughs> yeah. we were sitting here thinking about things like, wonder if he's ever done this? wonder if he's ever done this? Let's, let's ask him. Let's ask him. Maybe we put an idea in his head or whatever. But would it be hard right. to swallow a sword? I mean, you got the wind working against you. Uh, you know what? I'd probably jump out of the airplane first and then insert the sword while I'm going down. Now, I, wh- one thing I have done is I swallow the sword while dangling upside down. Um it was only in a tree, but I'd like to do it from a hot air balloon while dangling upside down and, and stick the sword up inside of me. Or possibly really... lower down on a sword? Yeah. Now, the, the difficulty with that is, now think about it, when you're hanging upside down, your guts are, are pushing down on your chest cavity. Your guts are pushing down differently than when you're standing upright because gravity, you know, hangs your stomach and your, your guts and stuff a little bit lower. So... It's it's very it's kind of difficult. It feels kind of uncomfortable to do it while you're hanging upside down, but it's possible. How about this? Have you ever thought about swallowing a frozen swordfish? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've thought about swallowing icicles, and I uh, when I was in Denmark, I was working with a, a marine research uh, company over there in Kjertum in the Denmark, and they they had a swordfish sword. But I don't know if you've ever felt a swordfish sword. There is gritty as sandpaper, really rough sandpaper. But I've got a buddy of mine in Hawaii who found a guy who makes swordfish swords into polished swords. Mm. So he'd get me a swordfish sword, so I'm going to try and swallow one of those one of these days. So yeah, I'll let you know when I do that one, okay? How about this? How about this? Swallowing a sword while buried alive. <laughs> nah, now you're pushing it. That's <laughs> <better story. laughs> I'll tell you we're waiting on the reaction. We got the we got the paper right in front of us about how you know you play off the reaction. So you know we're waiting That's on your right. reaction. Well, okay, you do it first, and then I'll do it. Okay? <laughs> You're the expert. 
<laughs> You're the president. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're, and you're also a, are you a hypnotist? You're a hypnotist also? Uh, I did get certified with National Guild of Hypnotists. Now, are you uh, practicing? Actually, are you practicing hypnotist? Uh, no, I don't really, I don't use hypnotism in my shows. I do use it when I, when I kind of rehearse my shows. And when I, when I kind of uh, perform my shows, I throw out a lot of suggestions to the audience about how sharp the, board, the blade is or how dangerous it is. And, and, you know, kind of make them cringe a little bit more than uh, it's. It's called NLP, uh, neuro linguistic programming, where you kind of mm. you, it's kind of using suggestive words to make people think in a certain way. But uh, no, I don't actually do it um, professionally. The sword pulling is really my one of my callings. It's one of the things that I really love doing. Now, I know one of the most proud uh, you're really proud about winning the Ig Nobel Prize in 2007. How did that come about? You know, that was a, the most bizarre thing. Uh, I'm going to back up and tell you just a little bit of a backstory to this one because it's really bizarre. Um, in 2007, I was living in Alabama and going through some really tough times. And there, I spent probably every night on my knees. I'd wake up to 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, and I just was struggling with, what, God, what do you want me to do in my life? You know, what, what do you have for me? And finally one night... I just said, you know what, I gave you my fears when I was in India. Tonight I'm going to give you my dreams. You can have my dreams of working in the music business or sword swallowing or entertaining. Forget it. You can have it. I give it to you. Now you tell me what you want me to do. It's up to you. And suddenly I got a piece. And it was like, great. But then I got this little silent voice in my head that said, great, now I want you to do sword swallowing full time as a ministry. And I'm like, what? No way. So I was working at a Honda dealership. I went in the next day, and I quit from the Honda dealership. This was on May 3rd. Two weeks later, I followed a 24-inch sword, 20 feet underwater in a tank of 88 sharks and stingrays from Ripley's, believe it or not, in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And the next week, I flew to New York, and I did the grand opening for Ripley's, believe it or not, Times Square. And while I was there, i just gotten off the plane, they stuck me in a limo with this armless guy and this um, um, Eric the Lizard Man and Wolf Boy and all these really weird Ripley's Believe or Not people. And I'm in the car with these people just kind of pinching myself going, oh, my gosh, God is just opening all kinds of doors for me. And at that time, my phone rang, and I looked at my phone, and I answered it, and this guy says, hi, Dan, this is Mark Abrams calling from uh, Improbable Research in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Did you get my email? And I said, uh, I don't know, I get so many emails. I might have. He said, well, I told you I had some good news. And I said, okay. And he said, you've been nominated for the 2007 Ig Nobel Prize in Medicine at Harvard. And I said, what? I just kind of looked up like, God, is this for real? <laughs> and it was like I could see God kind of nodding at me like, I got you. I got now, you. did you know what the Ig Nobel Prize was? I didn't. I had no idea what it was. And he explained to me that uh, there are 10 prizes that they give out every year in the field of science and medicine and finance and Peace Prize and, you know, everything just like the Nobels in Stockholm, Sweden. And they've been doing it since the 90s. It's been like 20 years or so. And all the world media comes. I mean, they have the New York Times, the New York Post, Washington Post, AOL. Uh, everybody's there. Just, mm -hmm. uh, it's a big deal. Media. It's a big deal. National Geographic and and uh, Scientific American, and everybody's there. It's broadcast live on NPR radio on, um, on Science Friday. So anyhow, they flew me to, to, uh, to Harvard, and I met Dr. Brian Whitcomb, the guy that I had written this medical research paper on sword swallowing with, and we accepted the Ig Nobel Prize in Medicine. I had no idea. There were about 2,000 people there, media. It was huge. And it opened doors that I got to speak at Harvard and MIT and Cambridge and Oxford and and all over the world at some of the top universities in the world. A few weeks or months later, I did a documentary on NTV Russia for 150 million viewers. Mm. Then I got to perform with Ringling Brothers Circus. And then I, I got to perform uh, with, on, I got invited to be on America's Got Talent. And I made it all the way to the semifinals in Vegas. As I'm sitting in Vegas in my hotel room at the Mirage Hotel, I looked at my phone and I realized it was exactly a year to the day that I had totally given up the sword swallowing to God. And I realized I've been seen by over 
700 million people in that year. And here I'm sitting at a hotel in Vegas. It was like blew my mind that God had taken me, you know, when I submitted everything to him, that he had just totally turned my life around. And it's been a, a roller coaster ride ever since then. Now, you say so many people have, have died. I guess 29 people, you said, have died from doing this? Yep, yep. Do you ever have the premonition that that might be the way you go? <laughs> There's a... Uh, in the, in the Bible, in Matthew, Jesus said, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. So, you know, if I do go that way, it would uh, it would probably um, be kind of fitting and, and add my name to the history books. Uh, with my luck, you know, I probably have a paper cut on my finger or something. Get it, <laughs> I'd probably die for something like that. But if I did, you know what? I've, I've lived uh, such a full life. I've been so blessed to do so many things in my life. That, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go any day now, so it doesn't bother me if something like that would happen. You know, before we uh, get off here, Dan, I want to I ask you to perform one of your uh, sword-swallowing uh, feats for us, if you don't mind, sure. for our listeners. Sure. And, um, and we're going to try to pick up all the nice little sounds and whatever. And it, Can you talk while, while the sword's going down? Can you speak at all? You know, I, I'll, uh, I'll try a little bit. I'll see what I can do. Now, what I've, I happen to have a sword right here with me. It's one of my favorite swords. It's about a 30-inch long sword, solid steel sword, double-edged sword, with about a 24-inch long blade. And it's about an inch and a quarter in width. It's a, it's a pretty hefty sword. It's nice and heavy. And it goes all the way down to about my belt buckle. So when I hold it up, it actually uh, clinks on my, my belt buckle down here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lick the sword first to lubricate it. And I do that for three reasons. Number one, to filter nicks and burrs on the edge of the sword. Mm -hmm. Number two, to lubricate the sword. And number three, to warm it up the body temperature. Then I slide it into my mouth, go over my tongue, uh, repress the gag reflex in the back of the throat, navigate a 90-degree angle down my esophagus, flip open the epiglottis, slide the blade down my esophagus, between my lungs, nudge my heart aside, go through the lower esophageal sphincter, pass the liver and kidneys down into the stomach, repress the rest reflex in the stomach all the way down to the duodenum. Once I do that, I'll try to say a little something. I don't know what I'll say to you guys, but I'll say something to you over the phone. And I want you guys to... As long as it's not call 911. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and, and, and I want to I want to remind everybody what's going on right now. Master Sword Swallower Dan Meyer is about to put a 24-inch blade down his gullet here on our show. Don't, First don't, time. Very important disclaimer, do not try this at home, do not. boys and girls. Do, do not only try do it, this at home. Only do, it on, only do it on the 25th hour radio show. That's right. That's right. All right, here goes. Got my 30-inch uh, sword here. I'm going to lubricate it here. Oh, it's a 30-inch sword. 30-inch sword with 24-inch long blade. Okay, all right. I'm, I'm lubricating it here, wiping the thumb with my, with my lips. All right. And uh, I'm, I'm sticking it in my mouth. And here goes. I'm going up. Oh, Lord. And there I pulled it out. Wow. And that is live sword song on the radio. Man, that was awesome. That I was mean, awesome. We got this, the sounds and everything. That was great. I mean, that's the first, I think, uh, on our show, I know for sure. I don't think, I, I don't know how we'll be able to top that. It's a, it's a first for me. I'm down here in Tampa. My wife was watching me going, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, speaking of that, um, you just got a new house, right? Yeah, just moved, just got married on my birthday on April 7th, and we moved down here to Tampa and starting a new life down here, and so blessed. So if you guys are ever down here in Tampa, uh, come on down. We'll hook you up with Bush Gardens and, and get, you, get you guys all taken care of. Oh, that sounds awesome. Maybe even take a dip in that pool. There you go. You got it. <laughs> Man, that, that is together. sweet. Congratulations to you also. Thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Well, Dan, before we get off here, let our listeners know uh, where they can go uh, as far as website, social media, and so they can get all the information about you that we haven't covered because there is so much information out there, so a wealth of information that so everybody much. needs to check out. So if you don't mind, let our listeners know about the website and social media. Sure. I'd love to have everybody come visit me at www.cuttingedge.com entertainment and that's i-n-n-e-r p-a-i-n-m-e-n-t dot com cutting edge entertainment dot com and you can see a bunch of videos up there or if you're on youtube uh look for captain cutlass 
for Dan Meyer, Sword Swallower, on YouTube or on Facebook, facebook.com slash halfdan, H-A-L-F as in Frank, D-A-N, or LinkedIn or, or Pinterest or Instagram or any of the others. Uh, I'd love to, to, as a matter of fact, if I'm performing in your area, um, come on up and, and tell me that you guys heard me on the program here, and, and I'd love to, to meet up with you and love to sit down and, and chat with any of you about what your purpose and calling is in your life. Um, at TED Talks, if, you, if any of you love TED Talks, um, you can go to TEDx Maastricht and see the TED Talk I did up there. I've done about four or five of them. I've got several more. Um, next month, I'm going to be in India and Armenia doing TED Talks and, uh, and, and all over the United States. So, you know, if, if you see me performing in your area, come on up and introduce yourself, and I'd love to sit down and, and chat with you. Dan, it's been a pleasure talking to you about uh, your life, and uh, it's been such an amazing one up until this point, and I'm sure you got a long, long one ahead of you. Let's knock on wood on that one, huh? <laughs> That's right. Well, I'd love to meet up with you guys. Next time I'm down in southern Illinois, we'll, we'll hook up sometime. Radio Show.